Welcome to another Sigma Live Hangout. We're here with Dr. Jasmine Westendorf from La Trobe University in Melbourne, Australia, and author of the book, Why Priest Processes Fail, Insecurity After Civil War, to hopefully shed some light on the Cyprus issue. Welcome, Jasmine. Thank How are you? Thank so you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Um, so let's, let's to get us started. Um, I know that you've been having some contacts in Cyprus and you know, to answer this sort of question on peace processes and I'm just curious how your contacts in Cyprus have been going. Very well and I should start by saying that I am not a Cyprus expert at all. This is my first um, time really focusing my research here although I have been here a few times before. And my research very much looks at why peace processes fail globally, why they have failed to establish sustainable peace and I'm interested in this conflict because it's so frozen and I think it's very unique in that the peace negotiations now are happening in the context of a conflict where there hasn't actually been outright violence for many years which is very different from other places and so most of my discussions with people who are involved in the um, negotiations um, or in the civil society movement around peace have been around their perceptions of what the prospects are for the peace process and what the challenges facing people here working for peace might be. Mm -hmm. And you know, so now you now I'm sure you know that um, we've sort of reopened our set of negotiations in uh, in May. Um, do you see much difference in the new peace process that has been started with uh, the new leaders, Akinji and Anastasiadis? My sense is definitely that there's more movement this time and that the situation, the contextual situation seems to be um, a more hospitable environment for those negotiations to be taking place. My sense is that the, the politics of both sides have shifted somewhat to the point that they're actually able to have these negotiations and start making some concessions. And certainly from some of the discussions I've been having with regular people and civil society people here, there seems to be a sense that people might be ready for a renewal in the peace process as well. Mm -hmm. And then. Do you see success? Because I know we've, you know, it's uh, hard when the, the conflict is frozen. It's sort of, you know, it's been stalled for a long time. Mm -hmm. So do you see success maybe in Cyprus's future this time? I think speaking about success is always very difficult because peace conflicts are so complicated and it's very, it's natural, it's understandable that it's very hard to build peace. Um, and to come to agreement after conflicts that have been long standing. You know, by definition, if it's taken this long to come to an agreement, it's hard to get to an agreement. And I think that in terms, when we think about success, we have to think beyond the agreement. I think that probably there will be some agreement in Cyprus's future. It seems like that's where these negotiations are heading. But more important than the words in the agreement, I think, are what happens in terms of the participation of civil society and regular people in the movement towards that agreement and then after the agreement when the actual transition happens um, to implementing whatever provisions are agreed on around government uh, structures, uh, potential federalist uh, structures, um, transitional justice or, or remembering processes and then obviously the issue of security and guarantors. And I think in terms of what could be um, you know, a factor that influences the successfulness is the extent to which the community is brought along with that process and feel that they're able to have input um, into the formal processes about what is actually acceptable for the people in terms of securing their own interests around security and economics and citizenship and so on. So you mentioned guarantors. Do you see guarantor powers as anachronistic as the government, you know, the Cyprus government now has said? And you know, even the Greek government in Greece, who is one of the guarantor powers, has said mm. they're anachronistic. And the UK has seemed to been playing you know, a fence on whether they will retain or not retain their status. Um, do you see this as something that could really sort of hinder mm. any p real like progress in peace? Absolutely. I think one of the uncomfortable issues in any peace negotiation is the question of who is a suitable guarantor. And there is certainly academic evidence that when there is the presence of a guarantor, um, that can provide the stability that's needed in the short term for the groups to actually start building the peace and implementing the agreement and then moving towards a more sustainable peace. The question is what guarantor is appropriate? And I think in any conflict, having guarantors that have been active participants in the conflict is very, it's difficult to consider them credible guarantors for the part of the population that feels that they've been part of the violations 
um, or the violence that's occurred. So I think that's a very difficult question here, particularly in terms of the role of Turkey. Um, and I think uh, the role of the UN uh, or EU forces maybe is, a, is another way of approaching the issue of guarantors as international forces that aren't so connected to the idea of you know, the, um, the, the powers that influenced the start of the conflict and financed and sort of mm -hmm. pushed the conflict. And, uh, you know, we've we've mentioned you mentioned the EU as well as you know sort of mm. playing coming in as a player, and uh, even the Turkish Cypriot community has said you know they have they might want some derogations from EU um, via EU a key. Do you think that it's sort of you know null and void to have derogations from the EU a key as the you know as the community since we'll be accepted into the EU as one country eventually? I. I think that that's you know it's a complicated issue. I don't I don't feel um, particularly well positioned to answer that because I think it depends on a lot of the political bargains that are going to have to happen, mm -hmm. both at the national level here between the um, the north and the south, uh, and in terms of the negotiations that happen in the EU that will shape whether those derogations might actually be allowed. And then so you focus on peace conflict peace processes at large, um, how can Cyprus sort of learn from other peace processes that are going on in the world? Is there something that we can take or we can even give to the world in you know, our management of our own peace process? Yeah, absolutely, I think there is. Certainly from the research that I've conducted of peace processes since the end of the Cold War, um, where I focus particularly on processes in Africa and Asia, the major factor that undermined success um, and that led to situations of insecurity and instability being entrenched in post-war societies was when the peace process, and by that I mean the governance building, security building, transitional justice processes, were divorced from the realities of the um, political and social dynamics within the various communities. And I think that what has happened is that often in when, the, when we focus on building institutions and building structures, um, we can miss the, the, the factors that influence the choices individuals make about whether or not they're going to participate in violence or support the peace process. That might be a little bit abstract, but what I mean in, in the context perhaps of Cyprus is what, what could be done here to avoid some of the pitfalls of other places is to ensure that attention is given to the perceptions of local communities on both sides of the peace process and of whether that peace process is satisfying their needs and of whether there is still mistrust or anxiety about the other side that might lead to further violence. And if the peace process can actually bridge the gap between the macro level negotiations, which are essential, but also with the micro level um, peace building processes that are going to have to go on within and between the communities, that would be, um, I think, a really positive step in terms of avoiding shortfalls of other countries. And I, I would just say one other thing, which is that the way to do that, I think, is to have a very strong civil society movement that is influencing the peace process. When groups of people um, at the grassroots level are able to organise and work together um, to figure out what they think would work in their situation to address their concerns, they can feed that up to the political actors that are negotiating or making decisions at the government level uh, in order to bridge that gap so you don't have a governance level that's separated from the grassroots in the peace process. Mm -hmm. And so how do you think um, community actions here and you know leadership here have been sort of, have they been promoting this idea or has this idea sort of just started to gain ground in Cyprus or do we need more of this? I think everywhere needs more of this. I think having a strong and dynamic civil society is of benefit to any democracy globally. And I think there's always a way that those, those communities can become stronger advocates for themselves and their perceptions. Uh, in terms of whether this is happening, I have been meeting with um, women, particularly from the women's movements for peace here in, uh, in Cyprus. And it seems like that movement is um, having an impact and is quite strong in some ways but is struggling to get traction with the broader community of women, particularly young women, to bring them into these um, uh, discussions about uh, the role that civil society and particularly women's groups might play in pushing for peace and what might be important uh, in terms of having women's voices represented in those processes. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned the role of women. Do you think um, 
the, I saw sort of a recent study on how many women leaders there have been, you know, globally. Mm -hmm. Do you think that maybe because of a, a lack of sort of women leader, strong women leadership, we haven't been able to see active influence in the Cyprus peace process from that sort of civil society group? I think that's certainly a part of it and the evidence globally is that in places where women aren't well represented at the highest, you know, in, in politics, you know, and haven't been elected to politics, it can be harder to, um, to mobilise women's movements at the grassroots level. But I think there are much deeper issues as well about the role, the gendered roles in society and the roles that women have tended to play as a result of the expectations around um, their roles in the family and the community as opposed to roles in the public sphere. So I think that's part of why it can be very difficult. The other reason is that conflicts tend to be fought by men. They're not always, but they tend to be fought by men and the decision makers tend to be men. Largely, I'm not saying that's because men are inherently violent, but it's because men have been more prominent in political um, and military decision making than women have been throughout the course of history. Um, and so because men play those prominent roles, a lot of peace processes have worked with those men that are the visible actors or protagonists in the conflict and haven't necessarily looked elsewhere in society to the other groups that might have useful and credible voices to contribute to the conversation. So that's an issue that's much broader than just here. It's something that we see globally that peace processes don't look necessarily for the women to include because they may not be as prominent in the society mm -hmm. um, historically and currently. Hmm. So as um, you know, as you've mentioned, you, I know you've been uh, also looking at uh, the mission of uh, UNPC here. Yeah. How is that, uh, you know, do you see them as a lasting member of the Cyprus peace process or even maybe something that'll last past, you know, any agreement or settlement that may be reached for a recent, for the recent future at least? Mm. There, there has been academic research that has shown that in places where the UN um, peacekeeping forces are present for a period of time after an agreement, the agreement is more likely to last mm -hmm. because they can be um, a very credible guarantor as we were discussing earlier. Um, I think that it comes down to whether they're going to be accepted by the local populations though. Mm -hmm. And if there is a sense from both the, um, the, the Turkish and the Greek Cypriot communities that the UN is an acceptable and a credible guarantor, then certainly I think they have the capacity to play a really important role here. Um, but that requires buy-in from groups, and some of that buy-in can be generated uh, by politicians um, who, who could potentially be more honest about which guarantors are actually acceptable to both sides, mm. I think. Okay, well, you know, thank you for your time. That was uh, very informative and a really interesting take your, to get your take on this. Um, it was nice meeting you. Lovely thank to you. meet you. Thank you for having me here. Bye-bye.